Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at orbits and satellites which forms part of the gravitational field topics topic there aqa a level physics so in today's lesson we're going to try and understand the properties of orbiting bodies so if we're successful and we learn in this lesson you should be able to understand how the speed and orbital period of a satellite are affected by the radius of its orbit calculate and understand the escape velocity of an orbiting body and detail the properties and uses of the different types of satellite orbit which falls into the following part of the aqa a level physics specification now, any object undergoing circular motion will experience a centripetal force. Now, a centripetal force is a name we give to the overall resulting force experienced by an object. Now, we only consider the resultant effect of this particular centripetal force. Now, the resultant force of a centripetal force will always be towards the center of the circle because it's an object undergoing circular motion. Now, the most common application of centripetal forces is the orbit of a planet around a star or the orbit of any satellite around a massive body. Now, let's consider the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Now, the planet will always have a direction of motion tangential to the star. Now, as this means that as the Earth orbits, it changes direction as it's moving in a circle. This means the tangential velocity is changing because its direction is always changing. So this means the orbit and body is accelerating. And from Newton's second law of motion, if there is an acceleration, there must be a resultant force. Now remember, the acceleration and this resultant force are directly proportional. And this is the resultant force which causes circular motion, our centripetal force. Now the force always acts towards the center of the circle. So in this case, it's like the Earth is constantly being dragged towards the center of the Sun due to their gravitational attraction. So it's a center-seeking force. So in this situation, the centripetal force causing the orbit is the gravitational force. Now, you might think to yourself, well, why does it move in a circle if, it's got, if, the, if the resultant force is acting in a straight line towards the center of the orbit? Wouldn't it make more sense for the, the orbit and body to go straight to the center of that particular gravitational field? Well, the centripetal force produces circular motion because it works in tandem with another effect. Because any object, such as any planet or satellite, will want to move in a straight line in the same direction. It wants to have the same velocity unless the resultant force is acting on it. So we call that principle inertia. So this concept was covered in the previous mechanics module. It's Newton's first law of motion. But the centripetal force always acts towards the center of the orbit. Now the centripetal force always acts perpendicular to the path of the object. Now that's another way we can define the centripetal force. It's any force which acts perpendicular to motion. Now, we can cover many different forces which act as centripetal forces in paper 2, such as the magnetic force, the electrical force, or in this case, the gravitational force. Now, as the force acts at right angles to motion, it can't affect the speed of the motion, so centripetal forces can't change the speed of an object, but they can change the direction of the object. So, centripetal forces cause acceleration by changing the path of the object, not its speed, so it causes acceleration by deflection. Now, this means that inertia and the centripetal force combine to form the circular path of circular motion. So the centripetal force provides an acceleration towards the center of the orbit. Inertia prevents the body from falling into the center. Now, the centripetal force and the inertia combine to ensure the object follows a circular path. So this means that if the centripetal force was removed, for example, the sun disappeared one day, the object, like the Earth, would move in a straight line in the same direction. It would move off in a tangent. It would revert back to the laws of linear mechanics. Now, any object undergoing circular motion experiences a centripetal force. And we know what the equation is on that, the periodic motion topic to calculate the centripetal force. It's F equals mv squared over r. But in this instance, the centripetal force, the resultant force towards the center of the circle is the gravitational force, which we also know, if given from previous work in gravitational fields, is equal to F equals G 
big M, small M over R squared. So we can actually equate the two terms because the centripetal force is the gravitational force. So we can equate the two terms with, you, with each other. We can then cancel out our small m's because they're common on both sides. Or we can cancel out one of the r's on each side of the equation as well because they're a common term. So that leaves us with the equation v squared equals big G big M over r. Or v equals the square root of G M over r. Now we can also say that speed equals distance over time and we know that the distance traveled in one orbit is the circumference of the orbit so it's 2 pi r or pi diameter and we divide that by the time period which is big T so time period the time for one orbit is equal to 2 pi r over v but we actually know what v is v equals the square root of big G m over r so we can combine the two equations and we can say t equals 2 pi r over square root of gm over r. We can then work it through, we can remove the brackets, we can move terms about to then cancel them through, and it gets us with an equation to be t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over gm. Now this is very important. 4 pi squared over gm is a constant. So we can actually say it's t, it's t squared is directly proportional to r cubed, which is what is Kepler's law of orbits. However, this equation of t squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed over gm is not given in your equation book, but you are expected to use that equation in examination questions. Now, this means you've either got to derive it or memorize this particular equation linking time period and the radius of the orbit. Now we can also use Kepler's law of orbits to work out properties of an orbiting body because you know t squared is directly proportional to r cubed. But this means that the greater the radius of the satellite's orbit, the slower it will travel, the longer its time period will be. So the greater the radius, the longer the time period. The shorter the radius, the faster the time period. And it allows us a comparison for orbit and bodies because we can we can use this uh, this directly proportional sign by making an equals by using a comparison between two objects. So we can say that t squared over r cubed for one object, object A, is equal to t squared over r cubed for object B. And then what you can do if this this can only work if the objects are orbiting the same body. And remember in examinations they'll expect you to know the time period of the Earth, which is one year, and the radius of the Earth's orbit, because it's given to you on the equation sheet. Now, just remember, because this is a ratio equation, any units can be used for values as long as you are consistent in the question. R, e, g, use years for both time period, for time periods of both bodies, you could use seconds, you could use minutes, you could use any, any unit you'd like to, as long as it's consistent, because we're using it in a ratio format. Now, here's an example question regarding orbits. Planet A and planet B are orbiting the same star. Planet A has an orbital radius of 8.0 times 10 to the 10 meters and a time period of 18 hours. Planet B has an orbital radius of 1.0 times 10 to the 12 meters. Calculate the orbital period of planet B in hours. Well, step one, you write out your equation. Step two, you place the values in. Now, just be aware, because you don't you use this as a ratio, you don't need to convert the hours into seconds because it's giving you planet A's value in hours and it wants you to work out the answer for planet B in hours. So you place them in the equation, you then calculate through the value, and then when you work it through, you make sure you give all your values to the appropriate number of significant figures and the correct unit. So our answer is 800 hours. Now we can also consider the energy stores of an orbiting body. Now all orbiting bodies have two energy stores. They've got a kinetic energy store and a gravitational potential energy store which add up to give the total energy of the object. Now, the kinetic energy store is due to the movement, whilst the gravitational potential energy store is due to its position in the gravitational field. Now, for an orbiting body, the total energy must stay constant at all times. So if the kinetic energy store increases, the gravitational potential energy store must decrease. But if that means that when the orbital radius is decreasing, the orbiting body speeds up. However, if the kinetic energy store is decreasing, the gravitational potential energy store must be increasing. So when the orbital radius increases, the orbiting body slows down. Now, for a circular orb object, this, orbit, sorry, 
This tells us the orbital radius is constant, so therefore there's no change in kinetic energy store or gravitational potential energy store, so the speed of the orbit is constant. Now we've got our two equations. Our equation to work our kinetic energy store is a half mv squared. And our equation to work our gravitational potential energy store is equal to big G, big M, M over R. Now note, we can't use mg delta h like you might have done at GCSE because this is a radial field over a large distance. So the value of small g, the gravitational field strength, changes because there's a noticeable difference in the field strength the further you go away from an, a massive object. Now, this means that if an orbiting body changes radius, then the change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in gravitational potential energy. So we can say a half mv squared is equal to big G m m over r. So this allows you to work out the new velocity of the body or the new orbital radius depending on what you want to know. Now, like we said before, you can cancel out those small m's and then rearrange to make it to be v the subject if you want to work out the new velocity or r the subject if you want to work out the new orbital radius. Now we can use the concept of energy stores to work out an escape velocity from a gravitational field. Now the escape velocity is the minimum speed an unpowered object needs in order to leave the gravitational field of an object and not fall back into the field. Now remember, we assume if the object escapes the field it must be at infinity. The gravitational potential energy store of the object is zero, but whilst in the gravitational field, the gravitational potential energy store of the object is considered a negative. So to reach infinity, to reach zero, a kinetic energy needs to be placed into the object. Now the increase in gravitational potential, uh, gravitational potential energy comes from the kinetic energy increase given to the object. So we can equate the two. We can say a half mv squared is equal to g big M m over r. Here in our equation we're assuming only the minimum kinetic energy is needed to just escape the field. We're assuming there's no excess energy left after escaping the field. Okay, but that doesn't make a difference because we're now no longer in the field so it wouldn't fall back into the field because there's no gravitational attraction from the object to the escaped um, object like the rocket. Now we assume that all the kinetic energy is given at the start of the journey on takeoff and we assume there's no dissipative forces acting on the object like air resistance or friction. So we can rearrange the equation and get V. And v is equal to the square root of 2gm over r. Now you'll note that this is the escape velocity of the gravitational field and it only depends on the gravitational field and the distance from the center of the field. There's no small m in this equation, the mass of the object escaping the field. That has been cancelled out when we've derived the equation. So this tells us that it do, the mass of the object trying to escape the field is irrelevant to the escape velocity. So the escape velocity is the same for a very small object as it is for a very large object. So it's the same escape velocity to leave the Earth's gravitational field for a tennis ball as it is a rocket ship. So r, by the way, is the distance from the center of the field, not the surface the planet, the, of, the, of the planet the object is on. Now, as it's a velocity, the direction this velocity is out of the gravitational field. But also remember that this is an idealized value for escape velocity. In reality, it, it'll be a lot higher than the value you calculate because not all energy is changed store at the start of the journey and there are going to be dissipative forces present because you are going through the atmosphere. There will be a very, very large air resistance. Now, this value of escape velocity is always going to be higher than an orbital velocity of an object in the field or otherwise the object couldn't orbit. So you've got to remember that the escape velocity is always higher than any orbital velocity you would calculate in that field. So let's look at a question regarding escape velocity. So if you're given the Earth's mass and the Earth's radius, can you calculate the escape velocity? Well, step one, you write out the equation. V equals the square root of 2gm over r. You place the values into your equation. You then work out your value, and we're getting V equals 1.1190 times 10 to the 6. So what we then do is we give our answer to the appropriate number significant figures. Now you'll notice 5.983, 6.373. So we're going to give our answer to three significant figures, 1.12 times 10 to the 4. And we always give our units. It's a velocity, 
meters per second. Now there are a number of different possible stable orbits in the gravitational field. Now a synchronous orbit is an orbit when is when an orbit an object has an orbital period equal to the rotational period of the object it is orbiting. So when this is for the Earth, we call this a geostationary orbit. So a geostationary orbit is a synchronous orbit, so it must have the same orbital period as the rotational period of the Earth, so it is 24 hours. Now, to achieve this, the orbit of the object must be in the plane of the equator. So, for you to achieve a geostationary orbit, the object will always be directly above the equator. Now, this means the satellite is always above the same position on the Earth, because it's orbiting at the same, at the same speed as the Earth is rotating. So, it will always be above the same position on the Earth. Now this is achieved with an orbital radius of about 42,000 kilometers on the Earth, which is about 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Remember, you've always got to take into account the actual radius of the planetary body because we take our orbital radius from the center of the planet. Now, these orbits are used for communication satellites. This is because the satellite stays fixed in comparison to the surface of the Earth, so signals can be easily sent to them because we know exactly where the satellite will be. Now, a low orbiting satellite is a satellite which is which is between 800 and 180, sorry, and 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Now, satellites in these orbits are cheaper to launch as they don't have to move as much from takeoff and receive less powerful transmission signals because they are closer. So this makes the satellites useful for communication, for weather, and for monitoring sites. Now, these satellites are very close to the surface of the Earth, as the name suggests, and that means they'll orbit at a faster period than the Earth will rotate. So this means an individual satellite wouldn't cover all of the Earth, so multiple satellites would need to work together in low orbits to actually work together in a network to achieve constant coverage. Now, an individual satellite could actually be used to map the entire surface of a planet over a long period of time. So weather and mapping satellites have a polar low orbit going from North Pole to South Pole and vice versa, and this allows them to scan multiple parts of the Earth over a period of time. So what have we learned in today's lesson? That the orbital period and the speed are related to the radius of a circular orbit. We know the derivation of t squared is directly proportional to r cubed. We know the energy considerations for an orbital satellite. We know the total energy of an orbital satellite. We know escape velocity. We know synchronous orbits. And we know the uses of satellites in low orbits and geostationary orbits to include the plane and the radius of a geostationary orbit. Now, if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we understand how the speed and the orbital period of a satellite are affected by the radius of its orbit. We can calculate and understand the escape velocity of an orbiting body, and we can detail the properties and uses of the different types of satellite orbit. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, looking at orbits and satellites with gravitational fields, and I hope you have a lovely day.